Hello, welcome to my demo of my volume renderer that I created for a computer graphics class that I took uh, called Intergra Interactive Computer Graphics for the University of Utah. See, it's a 5,000 level CS class. It's a class that you would take after taking the Introduction to Computer Graphics class. Um, this is a final project that I made for that class. Uh, we were able to kind of choose topics that interested, interested us and then implement some um, scene or demonstration of uh, an interesting graphics technique or or thing I wanted to implement, and I chose a volume renderer because volume rendering is cool. Uh, anything to do with volumes and voxels and you know anything like that, I find interesting. There's a lot of other cool techniques too that don't just involve that stuff, but this in particular was something I thought I could do, and I obviously did because it's right here in front of you. So let me demonstrate it. So this is a data set that I grabbed from um, some type of hospital uh, scan of a Christmas tree from somewhere in Germany, I believe. I could be wrong about that. but And they, it's like this public open source data set. And I chose it specifically because the data set was easy to manipulate and work with. It is basically just raw 3D volume data. And what I mean by raw data is that it doesn't really include any information relating to the... Uh, transfer function of how you would render the image. I wanted to kind of create the transfer function myself um, rather than, you know, have it pre-computed for me. And it, so I made a point to just to try to find the most simple, easily usable volume data set that I could find, and this happened to be the most appealing one. There were, there were several others out there, but this one looked like something that would, I mean, you could look at it and it, make, it looks like something. Whereas there's other stuff out there that you would have to spend a lot of time to control the transfer function to get an image that looks like something to the human mind. Whereas this looks like a Christmas tree, you know, it, it uh, makes sense. So uh, the capabilities of this volume renderer, obviously I can interact with it and rotate around. Hopefully this is not too choppy. Um, the, la the last time I tried to record this video, it was unwatchable. It, so hopefully I'm using, um, I was using OBS. Now I'm using uh, some game capture capabilities in my NVIDIA graphics card, hoping that because it's all done on, within the graphics card, it won't slow down and uh, encounter any choppiness because it should be a capacitive process of, ca of capturing the video. Uh, my impression of it is that that's the way it works. So hopefully this looks smoother than it, it, the then, I mean, hopefully there's more than one image a second. Let's put it that way. Because the frame rate I was getting was pretty terrible. So, we can zoom in and out. Um, we can... So right now, the way that the way that this fine renderer works is that we are projecting view rays from the view plane into this cube and doing a texture lookup of our position of the view ray within the cube into the 3D volume data. And then determining the nature of the surface that we, where we're at within the volume basically, and determining if we have intersected a surface or not. What my renderer does do is, it, it, and this is all done in shader code, mind you. So we project view rays in shader code. The CPU is really not doing the, the, the ray casting. So it's it's as expensive, basically for every view ray we're going, we're, we are just the, the performance of this process is, is as efficient as the longest tra uh, traversal of the view, the, the view ray, basically. So it's it, even though we're kind of it on some level, it's not very efficient to do that in a graphics card because like some view rays project longer than others. So and because it's all super parallel, um, and and all the processing is kind of done in these large processing groups. And the task takes as long as the long the longest task it takes to complete for like that the the work the worker group or whatever, you can end up wasting a lot of resources, but it ends up still being a net positive to, to render on the graphics card still even though there is some inefficiency with kind of this approach to volume rendering, it ends up being faster than the CPU still. Um, so yeah, um, we can. The, and the, what this is demonstrating is that when the view ray hits a surface, 
it will immediately stop the ray casting process and just kind of report back a color and that's it. It doesn't kind of inter doesn't continue along its uh, traversal and collect kind of more colors and then do something that is a, like a it doesn't do anything with that composites the background color. At least I don't think this approach does. Yeah, this one yeah, this one is a ray cast. We're not doing any transparency. Whereas if I hit a button here, and then suddenly we get transparency. So what this does is this will kind of accumulate colors, but it will kind of have some alpha transparency where it can be semi-transparent so that the view rate can continue a little bit until it's the color that's accumulated is opaque and there's no point to continue to collect the color, if that makes sense. So there, there's a bit more um, subtlety to the image that this, this generates, which is why we're kind of getting this interesting in effect with the, the coloring here. And I, I kind of subtly change the way that I accumulate the color with this process just so it looks a bit more distinct. But another thing we can do is kind of increase or decrease the step size of each traversal down the view ray of this volume renderer. What that means is that we kind of have higher precision, more detail for the the image that we're the, the the volume data set that we're projecting into, but it kind of subtly impacts the the end color that we get because bear in mind we're accumulating color as we kind of go through. So I could have done work that kind of normalizes the color the, the color that we are composing based off of the, the number of steps that we do, but that kind of requires knowing the number of steps. There's there's some challenges there and. I just didn't bother. It looks mostly fine to kind of step up the size or not. But that does explain why we're kind of getting these interesting, when we increase the step size, it does affect the the color to a certain degree, you'll notice. And then when we decrease the step size, then we kind of get this image that makes less and less sense. <laughs> and then when we, when we incre increase the uh, step size, then we kind of get this doesn't run very well because <laughs> it's doing a lot more computing but it, it, you get this image that does seem like it has a higher fidelity and I feel like there's a happy medium for the number of steps you get for the for an image that kind of makes is coherent and I think this is the happy medium right here so yeah um, this is a Christmas tree. You'll notice that there's little candles at what appears to be, let me pan this. Oop, I meant to pan that. A uh, little angel teddy bear thing holding a star on the top, it looks like. Um, little snowman dudes, uh, you know, decorations hanging around it. I'm not sure if there were leaves on this Christmas tree, and they just didn't make it into the final image or not because of the, you know, uh, the resolution of the volume data set is not terribly high. It takes up a lot of space in memory. The more it grows, you know, by a factor of, um, but increasing the dimensionality of the, the image that you have, it, it, gr it grows at a, at, at a higher rate, obviously. So the, the image size, the, the amount of space this takes up in memory is quite large, even though it's like a 512 by 512 by 512 volume data set or something close to that um, but it still looks pretty good you still get an image that kind of makes sense and my transfer function I chose something that was kind of in the domain of red and green because it was Christmassy um, and it, you kind of get this image that, image that makes some amount of sense uh, I wanted to do something that involved pre-computing the normals on like the volume surfaces so that I could do some uh, specular lighting, but that's a hard thing to do, and I ultimately wasn't able to implement it even though I wanted to. But it would basically it would have involved pre-processing the volume data set and using um, central differences method to calculate the normals on any given point in the volume data set by kind of like evaluating the nearby voxels and looking at those densities and basically trying to find the the normal based off of the adjacent voxels for any given point. And then kind of clamping that stuff within thresholds so that you don't really get surf, uh, normals for voxels in areas that are sparse or don't contain any data, basically. 
and then kind of smoothing it out using some type of averaging method as well for there's a lot of work that would go into that and i wasn't able to get i was i was i gave a first go at it and the results i got didn't look like they were working and i didn't spend a lot more time on it that is something that i would like to implement at a later date you could also do stuff like shadowing and shading um you you can project shadows into volume data sets with with uh, by pre-computing things as well and that might have been easier on, on some level than doing the well maybe not but it would have been a, a different challenge that might not have been quite as involved as as doing finding the surface normals for a volume data set anyway this is my volume renderer it looks pretty nifty as you will notice and um yeah i I think I might have another video in me for another project, but this is my, I think this is my, one of my, the more interesting projects I've done. Volume, because, you know, volume imaging and volume data is kind of cool, and you ever get the chance to kind of like look at volume data sets for brains or, you know, tissues or things that are kind of cool to look at on the inside that you wouldn't normally be able to look at, I would recommend it. Like, you can look at, there's, there's all sorts of publicly available volume data sets and volume imaging software that you can actually get and look at, at at some cool stuff out there and I would recommend trying it out even if you're not really interested in implementing your own volume renderer it might be cool just to look at some volume data sets they, they, they even have them in some uh, exhibits in like uh, science museums you know natural history museums and stuff I've, I've seen like kiosks with like giant touch surfaces that kind of let you do interact with them in fact I actually worked on on a creating like a, a demo, uh, some software that kind of demoed some volume data sets for the U for a professor. We were just trying to, we were basically just trying to take some existing open source software and and use it to demo some of their volume data sets on like these giant Surface tablets. It was pretty nifty. So uh, thanks for watching this video.